Hello, welcome to the Happy Profit Podcast. It is such a joy to have your company today. It's your favorite, Sarah, whether you're listening or watching. It's so great to have you with me today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is summer, baby, and it is hot down under. Glory, my favorite time of year, and of course, the most wonderful time of the year. Every time of the year is the most wonderful time of the year, obviously. Um, but I am a bit of a fan of the long summer days and summer swims and Christmas time and celebrating Jesus and being with friends and family. So I hope you're getting to do all the above. And if you are in a cold place, well, I hope you're staying snugly warm as well and doing all the things that you love. If you haven't already, please like, subscribe and share this podcast to everyone who needs to hear it. And then some uh, check out the YouTube video if you'd like to. Actually, today we had a little fun um, prophetic sign actually take place in the video. And so definitely worth hopping on our YouTube channel to check that out today. Just look for The Happy Prophet and you'll find the video here if you're not already watching it. I want to encourage you. I released a word for 2024. I will restore all, which you can also watch on our YouTube channel. I will probably put it in a pod for you as well as a little bonus. Woohoo, heading into 2024. But the Lord is speaking on lots of different fronts. And so I'm actually excited about bringing sort of a succession of words over the next few weeks. So keep an eye out, keep an ear out for those. Praise God. On to today's episode. Miriam Evans. Oh my gosh, is an amazing, wonderful. Her name is not Miriam Evans. Oh my gosh, far out, Brussels sprout. <laughs> oh my gosh, far out, Brussels sprout, Eva. I'll start again. Miriam Evans is my guest today. That's better. She and her amazing husband, Tommy, lead a ministry called Revival Mandate, and it exists to equip a generation of revivalists to transform uh, cities with the gospel of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. What a way to live. Um, she is a minister of revival, healing, and miracles. She's written an awesome book uh, called Glory Miracles, and that's available now. She's an amazing mama and all-round great friend. Um, you'll love this episode today. It really speaks into what the Lord is doing in this season, but what the Lord wants to do in your family, uh, whether you have kids or not yet, and if you do have kids with them, uh, and also how you can position yourself to be all in for revival. It'll really, really encourage you and bless you and set your expectation for 2024. So please enjoy uh, this interview, uh, this conversation with Miriam, and I'll see you on the other side. Miriam, thank you so much for being my guest today. It's an honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. I love you, love the show, and I'm excited about what God's going to do with all of us today. Yeah, I'm excited too, and I'm thrilled to finally have you on. I've been wanting to have you sit for such a long time, and so I'm glad we were finally able to do it. And of course, we met last November in Dallas and became fast friends and sisters. And so it's just been um, really, it's it's a joy to have you here today. So thank you again for making the time. Absolutely. Busy, sweet mama. So I want to jump right on in Miriam and first and foremost, love just to hear your journey into the prophetic. Can you share that with, with all of us? Yeah, Absolutely. You know, I think it's really been a lifeline for me, just the whole topic of hearing God's voice, recognizing, you know, his nearness. I think topics, prophetic topics, um, I like to demystify them if mm -hmm. I can. You know, I feel like once the whole topic of the prophetic was demystified for me, it really helped me understand that I've been hearing God's voice the whole time, just the yes. entire time. It's just kind of the word prophetic or prophet or prophecy was a little bit intimidating for me, maybe not for all people, but for me it was. And so my journey really progressed when I began to dissect scriptures 
where Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. And if you think about little lambs, there's nothing intimidating about them. Um, Mm. You know, they're not really experts on a lot of things other than just like, eating the grass in front of them and being really cute and tiny, (laughs) you know? And so I was like, okay, if Jesus is correlating his voice being like a shepherd speaks to his sheep, I think I can, I think I can like get into this without being intimidated. And so when he began to really show me just like his voice comes from, from love, I just begin to open Mm. up myself to to faith, really, just to believe that he wants to talk to me more than I want him to talk to me. He wants to speak to me more than my desire to hear him. And so when I begin to really connect to him and his voice relationally, then the whole idea of prophecy for future or prophetic for the present or things of that nature, um, the whole intimidation just kind of got knocked off for me. And and then I realized it was just super relational and mm. that he loves to speak to me. And that a lot of times because the Holy Spirit is in me, which is the voice of Jesus, a lot of things that I thought was just like my voice or a good idea or insight, I begin to find out oh my goodness, this is him. He's speaking to me. He loves me. He wants to help me out even on practical levels. So yes, that's just in a nutshell. I love that. So it just sounds like it was very relational for you when you had that understanding through the scripture. Oh, this is me as a sheep following the good shepherd. I love, excuse me. I love the simplicity of that. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. I feel like um, maybe because I am a little bit like a simple sheep. I'm not really sure, but the things of the kingdom, <laughs> they do make sense to me when they're simple. So, well, I think so that's, I feel like, oh, yay, I can do this. You know, I think so. that's what the kingdom is the kingdom. Oh my goodness. Excuse me. <clears throat> excuse me. The kingdom belongs that's to right. children, right? And not yeah. to I mean, necess- it's beautiful to be learned and we, and we want that and we love education and, and growing ourselves and highly recommend that. But in its essence, the kingdom is for everybody. And I even find right. myself, I love explaining things to our kids. Like I love it when the children ask questions because I think sometimes if, it's, if it feels like, oh, this is too complicated for them to understand, I've overcomplicated it. And even one day the Lord said to me recently, like, Sarah, if you can't explain it to them, you've made it too hard, like you for yourself. Uh, and so I, I yeah. love the, um, the simple ways of the kingdom. It's very childlike way of operating. So yeah, I, I celebrate that in you. That's yeah. beautiful. Oh, really thanks. beautiful. So you are amazing mama, amazing wife, amazing friend, minister of the gospel. Uh, but your your ministry that you and Tommy uh, run in together um, very much includes this beautiful family of yours, your five kids, um, and you just walk out beautifully um, preaching the kingdom and healing the sick and seeing people saved and discipled and delivered. And it's awesome and amazing. And so I want to ask you this, um, how you personally define revival. We hear this a lot in in different circles and church spaces, uh, but for someone who's very much a champion of revival um, and a revival in a family, how do you define it? Yeah, so I would say really definition, if you if you kind of break it down, the word revival is really something that was once alive that died. You know, I think that the book of Romans, you know, all throughout Romans, we can read um, in the Bible that it begins to talk about people who are once dead in their trespasses, Mm. but then they received Jesus and then they became alive in him. And I think that in the word revival, the essence of revival begins to explain to us what happens when the great reviver, who is Jesus Christ, comes into our life and everything that was once dead whether it be spiritually, whether it be maritally, relationally, Mm. uh, familial, any, even in our bodies, our physical bodies that may have been dead or sick, 
that when Jesus comes in, he in fact resuscitates us back to life again. And so, you know, even just the word revival, that that's what we see in the essence. But, but speaking of revival in terms of what it can make our lives look like, I believe it looks like when the presence of God, the manifest presence of God comes over a city, over a person, over humanity, and begins to recalibrate us to the standard of relating to God in his presence, in his fullness, the way that he intended us to. Beautiful. You know, we we find that unbrokenness, that unbroken communion, fellowship with the Lord that Adam and Eve had in the garden. Of course, sin came in, removed that connection, but then God sent Jesus, his son, to mm. restore that connection to us. And he did it through the person of the Holy Spirit here on earth. And so when we study revival history, which I love, when we begin to talk about revival awakening movements or men and women who carry a uh, revival, which is really just the Holy Spirit coming like a flashpoint that, that recalibrates us to the standard of what it's like to have the full manifest presence of God upon us, overshadowing us. And when that happens, it begins to overshadow in the world around us. And, and mm. I believe by nature, revival will challenge lukewarm, anemic, counterfeit Christianity. It's not mm. only going to encounter the unsaved, but those who are walking in lukewarmness, those who have allowed themselves to live in the counterfeit Christianity, who treat Christianity as a club rather than God, I give you my life. I give you right. my life. To, to do what you will. So I think revival definitely challenges by nature due to God's manifest presence being, being the essence of it. I believe that, that it will challenge lukewarm Christianity by nature. Mm. That's a, a really um, great observation. And do you find then the the revival being revived, something that you know, and wasn't alive coming back to life, obviously yeah. it benefits us first and foremost, but would you feel that, what do you, I guess, suppose or believe rather um, that the purpose of revival is then obviously you've mentioned that it challenges um, complacency around us, but what, what sort of, I guess, what do you feel is the goal of revival or what is it accomplishing? Yeah. I love that question. Yeah. I believe that the goal and the purpose of revival is to restore us to our first love which is mm. Jesus. I believe that the purpose of revival is to restore us to be in right standing with God. Revival is a gift. Mm. I, it is an act of mercy. It is an act of grace that the presence of God can come and visit humanity in such a way that we are in encountering the presence of God that that when revival comes, when you read about it, when you hear about it, things that have happened in the past, things that are happening now in the present, it's when people encounter the presence of God in such a way that they no longer relate to God based on what they were told about him, mm -hmm. based on what they've heard about him. But it is a face-to-face -face encounter of who Jesus really is, encountering his love, encountering his power, encountering his justice, where God begins to make the wrong things right. Mm -hmm. You know, divorce, it's wrong. He comes and he makes it right through reconciliation, through restoration of families, through restoration of, of lost loved ones coming back to Jesus, uh, through restoration of physical bodies that were sick, terminal illnesses, th those wrongs that Jesus made right on the cross. I believe the goal of revival is that we begin to see God for who he truly is and, and for his love for us and all of humanity. I love that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm so sorry. That's beautiful. I love that. Restoring us to our first love. And the flow, obviously, the fruit of that is well, I just feel like you just can't keep him to yourself after that, right? Absolutely. I feel like reaching out to others, not fueled by obligation, 
but by the love of Jesus that compels you um, to open your mouth is the, the best way uh, to tell other people about him. Would you agree? Or what are your thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. You are so right. Like that is the fruit of revival. One of the main and most important fruits is to share our faith with others, to share our testimony. Mm. You know, like Revelations 19 says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so we begin to share, what did Jesus do for me? Let me tell you, yeah. because my life, it prophesies to you. My breakthrough says that your breakthrough is next in line. And, and I believe that's even the essence of evangelism. Like we yeah. don't have to be ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. And you're absolutely right. Like salvation is the greatest miracle. So it's like when Mm -hmm. we fall in love with Jesus, when he, you know, we're restored to our first love, which is Jesus. We can't keep the good news to ourselves. We have to just share it with others. And, and I believe that is the most effective way, you know, like when Mm. we can take personal responsibility to share the gospel, I love inviting people to church. I love inviting to people to, to great events um, by heroes and people that I look up to that are going to present the gospel of Jesus. But I don't think that that can take the place of me taking personal responsibility as a believer and a lover and a friend of Jesus. I can't let that take the place of allowing me to share what he's done for me. And I think, um, I think that's what changes the world when we all do that together. That is so well said. I love that. Thank you. Gosh, it makes me excited. And what I love about how you and a wonderful Tommy operate is that you very much where possible minister as a family and, and include them um, in, in revival. And so on that note I I just wanted to ask your perspective on that have you been intentional in bringing the children along with you Um, or has it been something that sort of just happened and you kind of picked up along the way what are your thoughts on that you know as it relates to bringing the kids with us and just putting them in the trenches of revival I tell you (laughs) it's it's funny and can it be funny it's funny you parents know what I'm talking about there's um, bribery involved. There's <laughs> threats involved. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but there has been bribery involved where I'm like, come on, come to us with this meeting. I promise I will feed you. I will give you good food and treats after the meeting. You know, that's just a very practical level of what it kind of looks like, right? You know, having five children, yes, there were times that we just found that we had to be very intentional. Um, kids are not always going to feel like following their parents everywhere they want them to go, but we did have to make things very intentional. I'll give you an example. One of the things that I've been really intentional to do is Tommy and I really like to bring our kids, not only in services that we lead, but in services that others lead, um, or even kind of going on, you know, um, witnessing and I'll, and I'll get to that in a minute, how I had our kid, like I taught the kids to evangelize with me. I'll get to that in a second. But as far as like getting them into meetings, ministering with us, I remember there was a time that, um, I wanted my kids to be in a worship service with us. And there was childcare provided at this particular meeting, but I just really wanted to be intentional. It would have been easier for me to send them to the childcare, honestly, and nothing wrong with that. Hear me, nothing. There's times and places for that, but there was a season where I felt like the Lord was saying I needed to get them in the presence of the Lord. I needed them to feel what it felt like for the manifest presence of God to come. I needed them to be in a place where when God began to encounter people, um, because I'm going to be honest with you, for us saying yes to revival looks like saying yes to the activity of the Holy Spirit, no matter what that may look like. And so when um, I can think of, of times when my husband and I would be leading, we would have these worship services and we would tell people, you know, come up to the front, worship with us. Um, The presence of God is here. Sometimes people would be so overwhelmed with the presence of God that they, they couldn't stand. Sometimes 
people would be delivered of demons there in the mm -hmm. worship service. Sometimes people were crying, some were laughing, that were having joy. And I knew that I needed to have my children witness what mm -hmm. it looked like when the Holy Spirit would come and, and encounter people and the difference of, of what that looked like, because I, I didn't want them to go by so many years and and say, oh, I'm a little bit freaked out by that. What is that? I wanted them to be okay because then I feel like, um, number one, um, it wouldn't freak them out later. But number two, when God began to encounter them mm. and they would begin to weep or they would begin to laugh or they felt like, I, you know, the atmosphere is so thick in this place. I feel like I need to kneel or I feel like Whoa, I'm, wow, I I, I'm just having these different feelings. They were acquainted with it. They were familiar with it. They understood the ways of God um, that may not have been the ways of man. Um, and so I can think of times where we were very intentional to bring them into places and spaces where they could encounter yes. not only a sermon or a teaching, while that is extremely important that we raise biblically literate children, but I also want them to know what it's like to encounter the presence of God um, in the various forms that that may happen. That's awesome. Very much exposing them to the presence of God yes. and how he operates. I, I love that. It's so valuable. And so obviously we can do that in, in the corporate setting, uh, but what about, uh, and like, Never neglect the gathering of the saints. So, of course, we know we're all for that. But as far as a day-to-day -day operation of that goes, what does that look like for you, for exposing the children to the presence of God, for them encountering um, encountering Him? Yeah, we, we love prayer walks. We love taking walks as family, as a family and praying and just allowing the kids to pray allowing us, as a matter of fact, we just did that this afternoon. Um, you know, we're in the middle of a move in the middle of transition. So for any of you listening, if you've ever moved from house to house or moved to a geographical place, it can be very difficult to find mm -hmm. that consistent time to begin to pray as a family. But what we've done practically in, in probably one of the most busiest seasons that we have found oh, wow. ourselves in, which is right now, you know, travel, ministering, trying to do things online and physically moving out of a house into another geographical situation. It looks like driving down the road and praying together. It mm. looks like going on a prayer walk together. Um, you know, those are just some practical, creative ways that we have found that it allows us to be able to hear God's voice. I also love and champion asking my children in the morning, my husband and I yeah. both do this. What did you dream last night? Did, and, and for the younger kids, like my three-year-old, you know, we have a range. We're basically raising all the different ranges from young adult to teen, to preteen, child, toddler. And so it's like, <laughs> we'll ask, you know, what did you see last night? Did Jesus show you anything? And we began to dialogue about dreams on a regular basis because we want our kids to understand, like Sarah, we mentioned earlier in this in this show, that my sheep, Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. We want our kids to know that he's relational, mm. that he speaks to them. Even in the womb, we find that, you know, that's yes. biblical, you know, where you know, John the Baptist leapt in the presence of Jesus in the womb of Elizabeth. And so we want to ask, we like to ask our kids for input, um, mm. even for the big decisions, not just for the small ones. Another point, number three, if I can tell you a practical thing that we do is my husband and I like to bring them in. We like to ask them for their input spiritually. Hey, we're thinking about this decision. We want to call in a family meeting over dinner. Let's talk about the decisions that are before us. Let's talk about what we feel like God's saying for the year or for this month. What are you feeling? What are you sensing? And we begin to even give them really quick and simple language that some may hear, some may see pictures in their mm -hmm. mind, some may dream. Some of our kids may be more feelers where we, they feel the emotion of God. So we definitely 
have an open dialogue so that the kids can begin to hear his voice because where this this does lead down to revival because hearing God's voice is a road that leads to revival because he begins to show us what his heart is for humanity. He begins mm -hmm. to show us how can we change the world around us? Well, it begins with hearing his voice, yes. hearing a plan of action, hearing, you know, what is God's heart for America? What is God's heart for Australia? What is God's heart for the nations? Well, if our kids can begin to hear his voice at an early age, they're not so intimidated by those questions. How does God want mm. to revive America? And how does he want you to do it? And we we will ask our kids those questions at an early age and and tell them hey journal what do you sense him saying mm -hmm. what's your part to play in reviving the nation and reviving your school co-op we happen to homeschool so we have a co-op you know some of you may be listening and you go to school you know ask your kids what is your part in reviving your school system your school yes. district you know so um my husband and i happen to be in the religious mountain. We preach the gospel. Well, we want our kids to be prepared to hear the voice of God and to revive every mountain of influence because God may call them to government. Right. What does it look like for them to bring revival and reformation to government? So um, those are just some practical questions that we bring the kids in to begin to think and dream with God I love that. at an early age so that they can know that um, it's never too early. It's yep. never too late. Uh, does it matter the background? Um, you know, just as the apostle Paul says, we've all been given the privilege to drink from the same Holy Spirit, to, yes. to get our downloads from heaven on how we um, can partner with him to see the kingdom of God advanced. Wow, that's so well said and just so rich. And thank you for all just your practical advice. What I love about what you're saying, I, I felt like this sort of common theme of like, just as you expose him, it's, it, it's demystifying, as you said, right at the beginning. Uh, and it's also just creating this culture of this is how we operate. We all hear the voice of God. We all hear the voice of God together. Uh, we all are ex we're exposed to the presence of God. He speaks to us in these different ways. We encounter him here. We encounter him there. And then I'm part of his solution in the earth and my voice, my life is valuable. And I love the empowerment of that kind of way of operating um, as parents. So magnificent. And I'm just going to brag on Miriam and Tommy for a second, because I've had the privilege of meeting some of their kids and they're just amazing. And, and their daughter, Catherine is beginning to join them in ministry as a worship leader in her own right. What a voice! killer oh my gosh uh, but but I love Thank it you. I love just the way it's like this is just what we do this is who we are this is how we operate we all love and we all serve Jesus and and as you so beautifully said for for some of us that's within the church but for most people the vast majority of people will be outside the realm of the church and so equipping them um, for that is is vitally important and um, you're you're just amazing. You're doing it so well. So I oh. thought here is a person who should certainly talk to us about it. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. And you're doing a marvelous job. Oh. <laughs> marvelous mama over there down under. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Your kids are gorgeous. Fun. Oh, thank you. Yes. We're having a good time. But I think just, yeah, making it really normal in the way that like we operate so, so this morning jesse asking the three-year-old what did you dream last night what did jesus say to you come and, on and i think that's a, a really beautiful way to do it and allowing them to lead us i think too where appropriate so um a couple of weeks ago or maybe it was at the beginning of november um harry he's five it was the evening and before bedtime he just came into um, our room and I was I was reading and um, he just sat down and he was like the Holy Spirit's going to speak to my imagination right on my imagination and I was like I oh can I do it with you and he was like okay and he's like so come and sit down beside me and like he led me into like 
encountering the Lord. And it was very brief, you know, the whole thing probably went for 30 seconds. Um, but it was so funny because what he, we both saw the same thing, you know, he was like, I feel like the Lord's doing this. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's what he showed me too. And then he was like, okay, great. And hopped up and, and ran away. And it was not a big deal. Just this beautiful moment of connection with the Lord that he invited me into. And, um, and I think just those, so it doesn't, I guess I'm trying to encourage people that it doesn't have to feel overwhelming or feel like a, a massive deal. Just make it very normal, include them in your devotion, include them in your reading, let them lead you when it's appropriate. And I think, um, you know, you'll, you'll learn from each other. That's what I'm finding. Wow. Anyway. <laughs> That's incredible. Come on. I love that too, because I feel like even just the simplicity of your son, Harry, like, okay, we did it. We like, you, you can't underestimate what was accomplished even in the spirit, like in his little heart and things that were solidified in him, you know, and it doesn't, like you said, doesn't have to take 30 minutes or 30 days to beg God to encounter you. It's like, Hey, this is him. I hear him. This is what he's saying. So yeah, I really I love, love that. that. I love that. And I even love in the word, you know, it's summer holidays here. So just having like a bit more time to, to sit with them and, and in reading together. And we've been reading lots about Moses and the, the uh, Israelites coming out of Egypt and, and even, you know, the types and shadows of Jesus and the Passover. And, and of course you say, you know, explain things in age appropriate ways, but being able to point to, um, but there was a, a, a another lamb coming, <laughs> you know, that was a greater sacrifice than any animal or any goat could or could accomplish, any lamb could accomplish. And, and then being like, Jesus is Jesus. Yes. You know, like a, a savior coming. Yeah. And so they begin to just, I think if you just take time with them and you just repeat things a lot as you do anyway in parenthood and as the Lord does with us, you know, he's so <laughs> patient and kind. Um, It's just amazing what their little hearts will um, as they're exposed to it, what their little hearts will receive. And so, yeah, for parents listening or parents like yet to be, um, don't discount just the seeds and the small moments because um, you'll be astonished at what the Lord uh, will will do in their in their lives as you trust him and you just keep including them in their life with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Um, so Miriam, I, I wanted that. to ask you, um, really, as we as we wrap up, um, and and feel free to in- include twenty twenty four in this. So we'll do a bit of a hybrid here. Um, but if you have a word of encouragement uh, for those listening today, yeah, absolutely. I really believe that, you know, even if I had to say twenty twenty four, but really just in general, I think it can be in any year um, mm-hmm. that uh, God begins to start something new in our life, but it'll continue even, even beyond 2024. But I believe that in this whole subject of hearing God's voice in relation to revival, I believe that the Lord is going to give us a grace, a special grace to not only hear his voice, but to actually partner with his voice in action. Mm. You know, um, the Lord's been speaking to me a lot, you know, and we read in the gospels and Matthew and in Luke, when Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and they're demanding for a sign. Mm. And he said, the only sign that I'm going to give this adulterous generation is the sign of Jonah. And it wasn't saying that Jesus doesn't want to do signs, wonders, and miracles. We understand that that's how he lived his life. That was the gospel of the kingdom. That's how he began to prove the dimension of who he was as God. But he was speaking specifically to the people who were outwardly looking like they wanted to follow God, but inwardly, they were not willing to follow him. Mm. Inwardly, they were not willing to pay the price necessary. And so why did, out of all the things, why did Jesus speak about the sign of Jonah? And I believe because Jonah made a decision to be a sign, that his life was a sign. And I believe that God is, is giving us this grace, just like Jesus was like, you know, the story of Jonah being in the well for three days and coming out, it was a type, it was a Mm -hmm. shadow of Jesus going 
you know, um, dying on the cross, being dead for three days, going back to restore and, and take back the keys that, that were lost with Adam and Eve. And then he rose that third day and he came out and he, and he revived humanity. He, he made mm, a way yes. for all of humanity. Jonah had to come to a time, you know, the Bible says in, in Jonah one, three, that when God began to speak to him about how to partner with his voice to revive Nineveh, the Bible says that Jonah departed from the presence of the Lord and he went his own way and he wanted to build his own empire. And mm. so I believe that number one, this next year, God's going to begin to expose places where we have tried to build our own agenda, places where we may have um, wanted to, to partner with maybe something different other than the heart of God, but God's grace and mercy is here for us to turn like Jonah turned, to repent, to think different, and to say, God, I want to return to your presence. Um, send me on assignment. I want to hear your voice, but I want to partner with your voice in action to go to the places that you send me to. Um, revive me so that I can revive a city, revive mm -hmm. me so that I can revive a nation. And so I believe that God is raising up Jonah's that are going to be a sign, not just speak about the signs of God, but actually live and be walking signs wow. of what it looks like to say yes to God, to say yes to Jesus, to following him wholeheartedly, um, even if it makes us feel uncomfortable, even if it's not easy, but that we would be willing to push past persecution, push past discomfort, push past misunderstandings to say, yes, God, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, and I'm going to partner with your voice to advance the kingdom of God. And so I believe that God is giving us a special grace right now to recalibrate ourselves like Jonah, to ask ourselves, is there any way in me where I've departed from you and where I've tried to maybe make my life about something else? You know, sometimes as parents, we can get a little bit busy with kids and that's okay. I believe God wants us to be present in the soccer games. He wants us to be present in our kids' lives. So that that's nothing negative, but in that, can we, like we discussed earlier, Sarah, can we say, God, we don't want to depart from your presence. We don't want anything mm. else to reprioritize your presence. So in the soccer games and in the busyness and in the, in the schedule, show us how to reorient and reprioritize our lives this year so that we can, as a family, begin to revive and change the world around us wherever that God sends us to? Can we be a sign like Jonah to our generation, like Jesus was to our generation to say, no matter where I am, no matter where I'm at, no matter the cost, I'm willing to follow Jesus to the ends of the earth to advance the kingdom of heaven. And it's going to look different. You know, it may look different for me than it does you. It may look different for the listeners today, but I believe that there's a special grace for God to, um, begin to speak to us on how to follow him, but in family units. Um, mm -hmm. I have one more quick thing that I, I really believe that God's doing. He's raising up prototype revival families, revival marriages, power mm -hmm. couples, power families. Um, and I have a, I have a quick example to illustrate that. that. Um, so I, you know, uh, I do CrossFit. I love athletics. And there was one day that actually it was two days in a row. And it was the same thing. There were two moms that came with their children. One was, uh, one, her son was under a year and the other mom, her daughter was my son's age and your son's age. Uh, she's three years old. And both days, uh, the particular workout of the day, if you follow CrossFit, there's a, what they call a wad for the day, a Metcon or a workout of the day, uh, required running. And the moms had a decision if they were going to continue the run, leave their child behind or skip out on the workout or bring the child with them. And both moms made the decision to one mom strapped her kid in the ergo up on her yep. chest. The other mom just put the baby on the hip and completed the run with their children. And when I saw both moms, that day I didn't have any of my kids with me. When I saw both moms do that two different days, I heard the Holy Spirit say, 
this is what it looks like to intentionally say, God, we are going to pursue revival as a family. I love I, that. No child left behind. I can quit. I can sit on the sideline wow. or I can leave my kid behind as I do it because I think it'll be easier. No, even if my time may not look like somebody else's, even if my, you know, I can't, it's not time to compare ourselves to other people, but I am going to bring my children with me. I'm going to bring my spouse, spouse with me. We're going to run this race before us and we're not going to compare ourselves to others, but we're going to do this thing together. And I heard the Holy Spirit saying, I am raising up revival families where there's no one left behind, that it doesn't matter if maybe it was a little slow coming, we're going to run the race together and uh, without comparison. And, and, and there's, there's a transparency that God wants us to have. We're not supposed to be perfect. You know, the Holy Spirit said, you know, in relation to revival, I'm not looking for ex experts. I'm not mm -hmm. looking for experts. I'm looking for the hungry. So if you're hungry listening, I know Sarah and I are hungry. Well, you're perfectly in line to be chosen to, to lead revival and, and to change the world around you because he's not looking for experts. He's looking for the hungry. And so sometimes it might be a little bit challenging with our kids, but God is making room for us. He's giving us a way. Come on. That is a prophetic picture. <laughs> Wasn't right there. it? That's it. Yeah. He's making a way. He's opening up the door for children. That's Come on. Great. That wasn't by accident, but that <laughs> no. just happened. He's making a way for children. He's making a way for family. And we can't let children and family issues be an inconvenience. Yeah. We're, we're supposed to be transparent. If your family's not perfect, neither is mine. Good news. But we're yeah. going to be real with one another. We're yeah. going to get down to the foundations of the word together. And we're going to get healthy together as we pursue revival without leaving family members behind because we think that we may not look the part. So I uh, hope that encourages That's people. That's amazing. Out there. That's so good. And I think if you haven't heard, I just want to re, um, reinforce that this goes beyond, Miriam's not talking about if you're not in full-time ministry, you're, you don't qualify. This is for the whole body yes. of Christ. He doesn't for have, everyone. the Holy Spirit is not reserved for people in vocational ministry. Revival is for everybody and it's now and it's here. And so just, yes. oh, we're all in, we're all in together and we need everybody. We need the family. There is so much work to be done in the kingdom in the world, yeah. then there's room for everybody. And so this is very much all in families, all in together for the kingdom, for revival. Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. Yeah, Beautiful. for sure. So revival well is not just for vocational ministers. Mm. You're so right. I just recently read a statistic that said that 85% of Christians will never be employed by a church or a ministry. Mm. That's like 85%. And I wonder if the, if that percentage has even increased. So we mm. have to drive home that point yes. that the assignment of revival is for every believer to show the world that Jesus is alive. Amen. Amen. What a way, what a proclamation to end on. Miriam Evans, yeah. you are outstanding. Thank you for your fire. You. Thank you for your passion. Thanks for being here today and encouraging us. It was just a delight. Yes, I love you, Sarah. Thank you so much. We're so far away. Like I'm in America, <laughs> you're in Australia, but I'm so thankful for technology that I can yes. see your face and talk. It feels like a little hangout. Love it, love it. <laughs> love you, girl. I love you too. Awesome. That was awesome. Thank that you. That was so fun. Wasn't that so much fun? Thank you so much, Miriam, for being my guest. I hope you feel edified. I hope you feel encouraged and equipped today. I love the way that Miriam defined revival as a returning to our first love. Brilliant. I love it. I love her. Miriam, thank you for your wisdom and your generosity of heart just so grateful and how much fun for that little sign that the Lord gave us that this is his um, desire and his plan for us in this season. If you would like to know more about 
Miriam and about Tommy, their ministry revival mandate, you can go to revivalmandate.org. They also have some pretty sweet uh, sweaters and tees, which I am a fan of. So you can check those out there too. And if you want to uh, follow her on social media, just look for um, Miriam Evans. You can also look for Tommy and Miriam and find their ministry that way as well. Well, I love you, my friends. It's so great to have your company today. Bless you in this Christmas season. Remember that your life is significant. Be yourself, change the world.